Pleasant good day again, everyone. I am um, coming back to us to have a, a quick discussion. This one, of course, will be a very short one. It's, this is a bonus video um, because we want, I want us to go back to something we did at the very start of the process. In our keynote, we talk about culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. And then I also touched on the culturally relevant and responsive educator, the person behind the pedagogy, where the power lies, where the change is gonna happen. I want to be very, very intentional about this very short video because I do want us to understand where change happens. There's a lot of issues that we are dealing with right now when it comes to diversity and inclusion and equity and social justice and racial justice and um, looking at issues in school and looking at de-streaming and there are a lot of work being done. And then on the next side, there's a lot of really almost worry and complain and disappointment because we are not seeing the practical, physical, you know, smart, you know, changes that we that we are so are used to as educators when we do our smart objectives, right? It's it's specific, it's timed, it's 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 you know those things is in, it's measurable. We are not seeing that with the work we are doing, and I ask myself why. And one of the things that I, we have been discussing quite a bit is our own mindset. You know, our our own mindset. You know, you have heard the term equity lens. What does that mean? It means how are we seeing things? How are we seeing things as educators? And we talk about, you know, action from awareness to action and mindset. What does that mean for us? And so I really want to circle back to kind of just close, not the, I wouldn't say close, to open the conversation about our role in this work, our specific role as we are doing this de-streaming. You know, many of us, I've seen teachers, you know, get caught up in their, in centering themselves. And, and I'm going to be frank with you. It's, it's quite selfish of us centering ourselves in, oh, I can't do this. And oh, I can't do this. And oh, I can't do this. And we have almost defeated ourselves before we have started the process. And so, you know, Bettina Love in her book, which I, I, I love, talks about pedagogy, regardless of its name, is useless without teachers dedicated to challenging systematic oppression with intersectional social justice. So it's about us. And as we talk about cultural relevant and responsive pedagogy, we talk about the student strengths. We talk about the cultural capital, but I want us to notice who is, what, what are these things and who is being asked to act really. Um, we talk about the focus on language of hope Yes, we should get our students to do that and the entire school community. But who is starting that? It's, it's going to be on us, educators. When we talk about alternative pedagogies, who is that? Who, who is that? Who has been called? I'm trying to figure out what I really want to say or how I want to say it. Who has been called to act? When we're talking about acknowledging the unique needs of the students, who has been called to act? When we talk about making school safer for students and connecting to their identity, who is being called to act? It is us. You know, when we talk about this, these are just revision slides, but I really want to center them. Classroom instruction, setting the school culture and climate. Student voice. I had a, I had a beautiful experience this weekend. One of my past students looked at me and she said, Dr. ABC, I got it. I heard your voice in my head talking about school culture and climate. I got it now that I'm in the classroom and I'm going from different school, realizing that with the same issues, there are different culture and climate in the schools. And, I, and sometimes I think teachers and educational leaders, and I wanna to speak to all our principals, our vice principals, and all our educational leaders at this point, I think we forget that we are the persons who set the tone, the school climate and culture for the learning and development and for the change. You go into some school, you could sense, I was gonna say smell, no joke. Like, you know me, right? Well, if you don't know me, you'll get to know me soon. You could, your five senses could pick up the readiness in the building. The energy of the students, it tells you the readiness. 
I remember, sad to say, I remember going to a school in a certain area and as I came out my car, I was doing a visit and I came out my car and I literally walked to the school from my car to the door and a, a level of desperation and just disappointment and just, I would call it the give up energy, just burst at me. It just came at me. The school front yard or the school entrance of the building felt like nobody was there. It felt like nobody was in the building. And I'm going to be frank with you. It was one of my worst experiences in any TDSB school. I did say TDSB. Any TDSB school. I will never forget. It just, the place just felt given up on. The energy in the building felt. Of course, there were teachers in there. You could feel that they were pushing and they brought their fire and they brought their flame and their energy and their love. But the climate in the building, it, it was not good. It was not good. So you have to think about as an educator, you know, as I know I went a little bit off topic, but I was intentional about that. I want us to really think about our school culture and climate as we are setting to do the, the, the work of change. Think about that as we are setting to do the work of change. How are we centering school culture and climate? Are we centering those change? How are we doing that? It's very important that we ask ourselves, how are we doing that? Absolutely important. You know, how are we doing that, right? How are we doing it? Ask yourself these important questions. Ask yourself, you know, these important questions. So it's very important, right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely important. So we think about our mindset. We think about our mindset. And I, all I want, I'm not trying to do a, you know, a fixed mindset, a, a growth mindset, because my intention is that we understand that doing this work needs a growth mindset. And so a few things I'm just gonna underline, you know, as we think about the work of the culturally responsive educator, I want us to remember these few things that we shared before, these are not new, but I want to underline them. And you know, and as you watch this video and you have comments about any one of these characteristics, I am open to hear them. And I'm, and I'm serious about that, just so you know. So if you're watching this video and you have a comment about any one of the characteristics, you want to add a bullet, you think I am missing a characteristic, absolutely place it in the comment. <laughs> Guarantee, you, you'll be surprised. I have actually um, um, put an alert on the comment section of this video because I want to hear back from you. So if you're, you can go to the, uh, the video in YouTube on my YouTube page, if you're listening to it somewhere else and put in those comments, I guarantee you'll see a response from me. So we'll have a conversation. Oh, yes, we will. And I'll take your suggestions. All right. So please let us, let us build this for the future teachers. Let us build this more for other educators. So I desire to make a difference. What does that look like for you? Right. High expectation. What does that look like for you? And I always say, you know, it's, it's, it's not just about setting and holding high expectation, but it's a supporting of the high expectation. And what are you doing to support those high expectations. You know, we talk about socioeconomic consciousness. Remember, our students need to know that the world is bigger than their cul-de-sac. The world is bigger than the, the avenue and the lane and the pathway they live on. The world is bigger than where they go for vacation. The world is bigger than what they see on TV. The world is bigger than these little basic things. Give your students a global view of the world. Let them understand the beauty in differences. You know, teach our students to stop using the word, well, that is weird. What is weird about difference? That's something that we need to break down. Why is it that when you see something, you don't say, wow, that is different. Wow, that is new. Why is it, wow, it's weird. When you see a food, you don't understand. Before even tasting it, you use the word yuck. We have to think that these things, these things, you know, they, I'm going to use the word, they perpetuate certain things. They, they allow us to be complicit in, in challenging some of these stereotypes. Why is it that the first thing comes to my mind, it's, it's the yucky. Why can't it just be, woo? it's different. Oh, woo, that's something else. Woo, why can't that be the energy? Why can't that be, that be the culture? We get to do that. And I can tell you, I correct my students. 
when they do that. I said, why are we going to yucky first? We haven't even tasted it. Why are we doing that, right? And so we have to be careful, right? And um, constructivist approach. This is about teaching and learning with our students. This is about seeing our students as capable, but also inviting our students to learn with us and to share their ideas. A lot of us struggle with this, especially adults. And I'm gonna say this, I'm especially adults. I am very disappointed. Did I use the word very? I am very disappointed sometimes in my, in my, in my courses at the university level. When I, when I open up an opportunity for students to, well, decide on your own topic or decide on your own assignment or decide on this and, or help me to do this or co-create with me. And you get students who are literally disturbed because you didn't give them step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. You didn't tell them exactly how many words. You didn't tell them how many sources to use. You didn't tell them if they need you know, to put their name on the paper. Like, I know I'm being a little bit dramatic, of course, you know, I'm always dramatic, but it's that level I am, I'm seeing happening. And that comes from in K to 12 classrooms. It comes from the fact that we direct everything so much. You know, I remember the, 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 the great idea of many persons who are using, um, what are the outcomes we need? What are the outcomes? What are the, 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 the things we need to do to show that we have, you know, we learn something? And most times, you know, the, the, we, we put the expectations. Wouldn't it be something as if we really spend some time, if we really spend some time asking our students, what, did, what would you like our product to be like? Get them involved. We like to talk about student voice, but we don't do student voice well. We like to talk about student voice, but I don't think we are very good at student voices. Let us trust our students. And let me say this, let us trust ourselves to trust our students. I'm gonna repeat that. Let us learn to trust ourselves to trust our students. I know it's hard for some of us to let go of control. You know, we, we come from this place where teachers are the know it all and you the end all. We are not, <laughs> we are not. Take it from me. Every time I go to, to, to when I, you know, teaching grade one, teaching grade two, teaching my grade two, three split, teaching my ESL class, teaching my dancing class, teaching my grade seven, teaching, you know, I'm teaching university and college level. I am always, always, always excited when I come away learning so much more. Learning so much more. The other day I did a, 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 a course, a university course. Um, and we were talking about de-streaming and two of my students presented on de-streaming. And I just sat there just learning everything <clears throat> from them. But I've been doing work on de-streaming. I have been doing work on de-streaming, but that's not how learning is. My two students had a clear, strong, amazing voice on the topic. As a matter of fact, they are both board and uh, public school educators. How dare me not sit and listen? How dare me think because I am the professor, I would know more. How dare me think because I'm work writing on this topic, I don't need to you know, sign in and, and zoom in, that's the word I wanted to use, zoom in. On the, on the presentation. I mean, I zoom in on all my students' presentation, but I'm using this example. They are talking about a topic that I am talking about. And immediately I start to drink up everything they were saying. And I actually plan to use them as guest speakers in my course next, next time around. That is how you do that. That is how you, do, you work as an educator. I am asking you in this very short, did I say short? Look like it's gonna be long. Did I, <laughs> I'm asking us in this video, let us sit in a level of reflection. Let us sit in a space of humility. Let us sit in a space of learning. Let us sit in a space of unlearning and say to ourselves, in this work we do enough de-streaming, in this work we do enough new ideas, in this work we do enough equity, in this work we do enough inclusion, in this work we do enough disrupting, in this work we do enough culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy, in this work we do enough loving 
and caring for the, per the children in our care. How do we as adults, how do we as educators step back and say, how do I ensure that it is about my students and not about me? And so, you know, it's about your practices. I could put tens of bullets here. As a matter of fact, I always think I shouldn't even put any bullet here. You know, dynamic and open to change, great. But what does that look like for you? What does that look like in your classroom? And you teach from the heart. I'm gonna leave it there without saying <clears throat> another word. We teach from the heart. If we forget the heart, <clears throat> sorry, if we forget the hard part of the teaching, we have defeated the purpose. If we have forget the hard part, what, I always say, what is it that brought you to this profession? And if you forget the hard part of teaching, <laughs> if you forget that teaching has a level of care that many other professions don't, you're dealing with people's children. I always say other people's children. Because you can take care of your own. It's easy. We, we do that well for our own. But how do we show that love and care for other people's children? How do we allow students when they're going through situations in our classrooms to not feel like we are attacking them or not feel like we are, we are um, judging them or we are, everything is in, in some form of inquisition, but it's just a care. You know, I'm concerned about this, 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 this behavior. I'm concerned about this outburst. I'm worried about you for, for your attendance pattern. If we use those language, the language of hope, wow. If we use the language of hope, right? If we use that language of hope that say to our students, I see you, that language of hope, what would it be like? Thank you so much for engaging. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to your questions and your comments in the box um, on the original YouTube page. I do look forward to that because I want us to engage into this conversation more about ourselves, about us, the culturally responsive educator. Not the culturally and responsive, but the culturally responsive educator. I'm sure you realize I took up the word um, relevant because I wanted to focus on being responsive. All right. Wonderful. Have yourselves a wonderful day. And thank you so much for engaging in this conversation with me.